The morning of May 3rd, 1999 started out like any other spring morning in Oklahoma. Temperatures were in the mid-60s and a thin layer of clouds hung overhead. The air was extremely humid, with dew points similarly in the low to mid-60s. Forecasters that morning were in general consensus that severe weather was indeed likely across much of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas, but there was uncertainty regarding more specific details. This led forecasters at the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, to issue a slight risk for much of the region. As the hours progressed, confidence rose as the possibility of a significant severe weather outbreak become more and more probable. Ahead of the dry line, the cloud cover that had protected much of Oklahoma from the sun's rays began to disperse, leaving blue skies in its wake. This allowed for extensive destabilization of the area as peak daytime heating began. By afternoon, this, combined with the ample moisture and strong directional shear present, made the atmosphere prime for explosive supercellular development. With the threat growing, the SBC elected to up the risk level to the highest possible level, a high risk, as more and more data began to flow in, suggesting that something major was about to occur. And between 3 and 4 p.m., the first areas of agitated cumulus clouds began to develop and mature into full-blown supercells in southwestern Oklahoma. It only took a matter of minutes for these cells to become severe, as hail up to a quarter size was soon reported in the city of Lawton. It wasn't long after that that the storms became tornadic, with the first tornado warning being issued at 4.47pm for portions of Caddo, Comanche, and Grady counties. Four minutes later, the first tornado report of the day was submitted to the National Weather Service Office of Norman. By 5pm, it was clear a significant tornado outbreak was underway. NWS Norman issued a short weather forecast around this time, highlighting the high possibility that some of these storms may threaten the Oklahoma City metro area within the coming hours, warning residents of the chance for strong tornadoes. With this information, the residents of OKC and surrounding communities began to hunker down, but nothing they could do would prepare them for the horror they would witness that evening. Uh, the funnel at ground level is now growing. Uh, it looks like it's a little bit wider than it was a while ago. Oh, this is one beautiful tornado. Uh, it keeps throwing up all kinds of debris through the air. It's moving, it looks like it's moving north-northeast. Almost pretty much north-northeast. I mean, it's not, uh, maybe even due north, I don't know. One supercell in particular would stand out from those surrounding it. This storm would quickly begin producing intense tornadoes, spawning two F3s near the communities of Cyril and Cement in Caddo and Grady counties. One of these tornadoes would severely damage the Chickasha Municipal Airport, nearly destroying a pair of hangars. This tornado would soon lift, but that supercell would simply not waver. As it recycled, rotation would gradually intensify until shortly after 6pm it produced another tornado. This tornado would quickly prove to be much more formidable than its predecessors. It would quickly attain violent status as F4 damage would soon be documented east-northeast of the town of Amber. The twister would also rapidly grow in size, growing to be as large as one mile wide as it approached the small community of Bridge Creek. As the tornado moved into Bridge Creek, it would also reach peak intensity. Dozens of homes were flattened and swept clean off of their foundations. Surveyors know that the debris from these homes was granulated into small, fine particles. Trees and shrubs were completely debarked in many cases, and the ground was scoured, leaving behind a muddy scar. As the tornado was passing through Bridge Creek, a nearby Doppler radar on wheels picked up wind speeds of 301 miles per hour within the tornado, the highest wind speeds ever recorded on planet Earth. However, the worst was still to come. As the tornado continued to move to the northeast, it approached the Oklahoma City and more metropolitan area. Hundreds of thousands of people were in the path of the tornado. 
right now. You folks in Tunnel Papa are in the street. Let's be, hear well, let's be quiet for just a second. We'll see if we can hear that sound. You can hear the roar. You can hear the tornado on 89th Street. Please, we plead with you. You absolutely have got to get down. Get, get to the lowest level you possibly can. We plead with you. Do not take the extra minute or two. We plead with you to get below ground. Get an interior closet in the bathroom. Get in the bathroom. As the tornado exited Bridge Creek, it would slightly weaken for a short period of time before attaining F5 status once again near the Grady-McLean County line, where another well-built home would be wiped from existence. It was around this time that the tornado became heavily rain-wrapped, making it difficult to see for those in its path. For many, their only eyes on the dangerous tornado came from their televisions, where meteorologists including Gary England relayed radar observations to the public. Helicopter pilot Jim Gardner was also key to saving many lives during the event as he closely followed the tornado during its reign of terror from the sky, documenting nearly every stage of its life. Shortly before 7pm as the twister entered Newcastle, the National Weather Service office in Norman elected to issue the first ever tornado emergency, as it became ever clearer that a violent tornado was moving into some of Oklahoma's most populous areas. As the clock struck 7, the tornado would cross Interstate 44 in Newcastle. Many terrified motorists with few choices chose to shelter under highway overpasses as the tornado bared down on them, a decision that would cost one woman her life. It was also around this time that a brief satellite tornado would form alongside the main twister, producing only F-Zero damage. At this time, officials at the Storm Prediction Center and the National Weather Service office in Norman began to enter emergency protocols the tornado passed just mere miles away from them leading to responsibility to issue warnings and statements regarding the ongoing outbreak being temporarily handed over to officials at the National Weather Service office in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and meteorologists at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. The tornado would undergo a short period of extensive weakening as it moved into extreme southern Oklahoma City. Only F2 damage would be documented in this area, but after only a few minutes the tornado would become violent once again. Indeed, as the tornado entered the city of Moore, it would attain F5 status for the third time. Hundreds of people would be injured and 17 people would be killed as the tornado flattened subdivision after subdivision in the suburban town, wiping out communities in seconds. In one of these subdivisions, a plane wing believed to have possibly been from the Chickasha Municipal Airport, which, as you may remember, was hit by one of the tornadoes prior to the Bridge Creek Moore F5, was found amidst the rubble. Around this point, spectators in downtown Oklahoma City who were attending games played by the minor league Oklahoma Redhawks and Oklahoma City Blazers were evacuated from their seats and taken to underground storage areas and emergency shelters at Chickasaw, Bricktown Ballpark, and the Ford Center, respectively. Flights at Will Rogers National Airport were also grounded, and an honor ceremony at Westmore High School paused. Over 400 people attending the ceremony were taken to shelters just minutes before the tornado struck the school. Thankfully, due to ample warning time, everyone in attendance survived. As the tornado re-entered Oklahoma City, it would begin to weaken, albeit slightly. Continued F4 damage would be documented as the tornado damaged several buildings at Tinker Air Force Base. The twister would then proceed into Dell City and Midwest City, where several factories and commercial structures would be destroyed. One sector of damage near Rose State College in Midwest City was considered for F5 classification, though it was ultimately rated high-end F4. The tornado would then rapidly weaken, before finally lifting to the east of Oklahoma City. As the tornado ascended into the sky, it took the lives of 36 people with it. An estimated 583 people suffered varying degrees of injuries as a result of the storm. Nearly 10,000 buildings were either damaged or destroyed by the twister, amounting to over $1.2 billion in damage, the first time a tornado had ever caused over $1 billion in damages. Several additional people died shortly after the tornado from heart attacks or injuries sustained taking shelter. 
The Twister was the deadliest to strike Oklahoma since 1947, and was at the time the costliest tornado in U.S. history. It was also the last tornado to ever be given an F5 rating, as the original Fujita scale was retired eight years later in 2007 in favor of the improved Enhanced Fujita scale, or EF scale, that is still in use today. NWS research has determined that the death toll could have easily been much higher had the National Weather Service and local news stations not given those in the path such advanced and effective warnings. In the months following the disaster, thousands of volunteers from around the country descended on central Oklahoma to help with the cleanup. It took years for the area to recover, but as the 20th century turned into the 21st, the neighborhoods destroyed by the Twister had begun to rebuild. In time, the communities were rebuilt. Memorials were built for the victims, and measures were taken to prevent a similar disaster. During the 2000s, an over $12 million project was undertaken to construct storm shelters across the Oklahoma City metropolitan area to provide residents with secure in-home shelters to use in the case of future tornadic events. Over 6,000 safe rooms and shelters were constructed as a result of the project. It didn't take long for them to be put into use either, as just four years later in 2003, an F4 tornado struck many of the same areas and more and adjacent cities. Ten years after that, many of these shelters would be used once again, as another EF5 tornado struck more. Neither tornado killed as many as the 1999 tornado, with the former killing nobody, largely in part to these shelters. The 1999 Moore Tornado was one of the most violent tornadoes of all time, and will not soon be forgotten by those who experienced it. Certainly, it has a fair argument for the title of the strongest tornado of all time. Within it, we can learn several valuable lessons. One such lesson that may be overlooked is the fact that overpasses are simply not good options for shelter when it comes to tornadoes. Overpasses act as wind tunnels when tornadoes pass over them, enhancing the winds within the tunnel, making the environment within them arguably even more dangerous than areas out in the open. Several individuals unfortunately died during the 1999 Moore tornado after taking shelter under overpasses. When out on the highway and you aren't able to access a nearby significant structure, taking shelter in a ditch should be a much better option than sheltering under an overpass. Ditches allow you to get below the winds of the tornado, and keep you away from dangerous flying debris. Though they obviously aren't the safest option for shelter, if you ever find yourself in an emergency situation with a tornado approaching on a highway, the ditch will be a lot safer than the overpass. Alongside this, the Moore Tornado also taught us the importance of early and effective warning. Many lives were saved by the good work of the National Weather Service and local TV stations. The ample warning time and the use of the innovative methods of warning, including the tornado emergency, likely saved dozens more from perishing. The coverage provided by Gary England, Mike Morgan, and others set the standard for future severe weather broadcasts as well, providing a prime example for other television meteorologists to follow over the preceding decades. And, finally, the storm also taught us the lesson of community. Even in the face of total obliteration, Moore, Newcastle, Bridge Creek, Oklahoma cities, and surrounding cities came together. They mourned as one, rebuilt as one, and came back together and stronger than before. Though battered and bruised, the communities remained steadfast and persevered, becoming role models for other communities across the world coming back from significant natural disasters. With that, thank you for watching. Please feel free to leave a like and subscribe as this helps our content reach newer audiences. We'd also love to see what you have to say in the comments section, whether it be your own personal experiences with this tornado or commentary on the video. Goodbye, see you next time, and once again, thank you for watching.